buenas noches. Muy buenas noches. I'm Malta Moreno Vega, director and creative of Creative Justice Initiative, uh, the host of this evening's discussion. And this is the second uh, part of a panel we had two years ago and uh, where we were exploring the topic of when the law is not the law. And we thought that when we did the first part that uh, we would see improvement, right? And I think that the reason we're doing the second part is because uh, there are questionable, very questionable actions that are being taken uh, by people who are supposed to protect us that uh, obviously are not. And we thought we would bring the panel again uh, to explore the topics that are of concern to us at this moment. And uh, also involve you in thinking about how we take the next steps and what are those next steps and what are the issues we should be focusing on and the practice, the narrative, the actions that should be taken because as a mother, as a grandmother, um, I have two granddaughters and I, with all the work that I have done, I can't promise them the advantages and the privileges I had. I have godchildren, goddaughters, and we can't promise what we thought we could promise. So uh, this is a moment in history that we need to look at critically uh, analyze critically and get the advice and insights of people who are expert in the field. So I'd like to introduce you uh, to our panelists. I'd like to introduce you to a discussion, right? It's not a sit back kind of conversation. It's an action oriented conversation. And we're asking our experts and our panelists, our friends uh, to help us think this through. So let me introduce you to Isi Matai, a lawyer who's on our board of directors. Hi, Isi. <laughs> Juan Hello. Cartagena, a lawyer as well, uh, Rutgers University. Um, Monifa Bendeli, Akamoli Bendeli, uh, my goddaughter, as well as an expert uh, in various fields, but especially our culture and the issues that affect us on a daily. And you will be meeting Esmeralda, who's having technical difficulties, and we're helping her try to get on. So we'll start because um, time is of the essence, and we want to bring as many issues to the table as we can. So I asked the panelists to think about that issue that is most concerning to them uh, and what the steps should be in addressing those concerns. So can we start with you, Isis? Sure, Isis, sure. You Thank you in? for ha okay. having me in. It's uh, I can't believe that two years has gone by. So the COVID pandemic time is not like regular time. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, but so much has happened over these past two years. We've had an election, an insurrection, and and so many other things. But I think that the 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 overriding thing that still concerns me is the anti-democratic trends um, in this country. They're global, but but how they're manifesting in this country with regard to um, still suppression of the vote, uh, still uh, uh, tactics that are used like gerrymandering tactics that are used uh, to deny. Um, self-determination and and the power of the vote and you know whether that actually means something um in, in this day and time and and whether um that is something that is going to be protected um i think that um well, that is the, the foundation and the basis i'm sorry well who protects it ec is if we see the courts right um uh, being manipulated if we're seeing, uh, right, even the Supreme Court, now questionable actions by different members of the Supreme Court, 
So how do you see that? How do you understand that? Well, I think that it mean I think it's basically vigilance at the at the personal level. Um, I think that the there has been a very concerted effort to place uh, infrastructure of an anti-democratic nature in, for instance, state houses, for instance, um, election overseeing positions, um, uh, secretaries of state, governors, et cetera, et cetera, to have people in those overseeing positions that will take anti-democratic measures. And then the pushing forward of very fringe theories like a theory that is now being actually uh, debated or, or argued before the Supreme Court in a case called, I think, Moore v. Harper. And it has to do with the North Carolina gerrymandering case mm -hmm. and put forth a theory called um, the independent state legislature theory, which essentially says that the, le the state legislatures are essentially without limits in their ability to um, regulate not just state elections, but federal elections to the point where even the Supreme Courts of those states and the Congress of the United States and the Supreme Court of the United States doesn't have a place in overriding what those legislatures do. And it, it just opens the door for all kinds of um, takeovers essentially, and, and overriding of the, the will of the people. So I think that um, to your question, who protects it? We all have a vested interest in protecting this, right? And we all have to figure out how to um, put that check in, in, in place, that check and that balance in place, when these theories are promulgated, when these people go up for election, when these bills come through, to make the voice be heard, to say that this is not an acceptable thing to do. And to have people in place that are committed to the ideals of democracy and at least free and fair elections. I mean, I think that's you know, there are guardrails and people who are gatekeepers and there are um, the other side is, is, is really making a concerted effort to place people in those positions of authority and, and oversight that shouldn't be there and, and they should be challenged. Thank you. Juan, can we move on to you? Because I, I, my ears perked up when you said, as a cultural worker, right, in addition to being a, a lawyer, that you've been going into the schools and seeing and hearing that our children are in danger. Definitely. Uh, gracias, Malta. Uh, definitely. I mean, the, the inability of our public school systems that have never been able to fully uh, invest in, in the incredible talent that we have in our own communities um, has been tested one more time with the pandemic. And we're seeing that a lot more now as school teachers consistently tell us with our cultural work that the students are really pretty far behind and those layers that we've lost in the pandemic are significant. Um, but I wanna add one more item and put it on the table and that is the incredible economic gap that exists in our country and in the entire world in which you have an incredibly larger gap between people who earn regular wages and the ultra ultra rich and the billionaires that have been able to uh, continue to enforce their worldview of politics and society and acceptance and what we've seen over the time is that we I've been able to recognize that a lot, and that's why I love the name of this, this conversation, when the law is not the law. Uh, when, I, when I first started getting steeped in the issues, I mean, even simple issues like civil disobedience with my teachers like Richie Perez and, and with Panama Alba, you know, you learn, learn a lot of things about how law operates um, in ways to continue to continue that economic divide and that inability of poor people and working class people to actually go beyond uh, the limits of what they have when they started in the workforce and how the entire economic system 
develops in a way to increasingly exploit their labor and to the enrichment of the people with incredible wealth and opportunities. When I started going down that road, I learned very quickly that, you know, an unjust law is no law at all, right? An unjust law is not a law. And that quote apparently goes back to St. Augustine, but you see it in the work of Harriet Tubman. And we saw in the work of Cesar Chavez. We saw in the work of, my, of Gandhi. And we see it everywhere else. Uh, we, I was trained as a lawyer, but I was schooled by my mother in a working class uh, Puerto Rican neighborhood here in the United States. And whatever tools I got to continue to help on the issue of racial justice and social justice are always being done with, the, that, with that larger goal in mind. And that is law is but a tool to go to a different and better place. So if you ask me again, what's the biggest concern that I have right now is that outrageous gap in assets that the ultra wealthy are now uh, hoarding and using it to exploit us in every way, shape and form. Thank you. And what do you think would be the action that we take as workers, right? Because we are uh, mm -hmm. the workers. And right now, uh, the move that we are hearing about censorship of voice. Yes. Right? Censorship of action, censorship of body, and right to our body and right to the decisions of our body. Then what does it what does that mean for us? What is the action? You know, my action would be like everybody should stop working for at least two days. Yeah. Whatever's gonna happen, the whole system stops and breaks right. down, right? Un, un, un paro nacional. Yeah. I mean, we've yeah. seen it we've seen it exhibited in other countries and it's in the in the uh, on the global scale. Um it lends to itself, Malta, to collective activism and collective organizing. I mean, the lessons that we learned as 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 workers in the early 1900s are still not are still should be heated today, and that is organizing around unionization, organizing around issues. I just got involved in a union strike because I'm a I'm an adjunct professor at Rutgers University, both at the law school and at the university level, and for me, that's full circle. I did union organizing when I was with a young attorney with the Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund. And now, much later on in me, in me be a hiss, I was walking a picket line just as recently as a couple of months ago. So the answer is incredible to create those spaces in which we recognize the very, the very, very power of our collective action. It might be in the unionization movement. It might be to force public schools to increase resources. It might be to challenge uh, or to raise up and vote in different ways, as Issa mentioned, and the outrageous things about the attacks on our democracy. But collective action is still the best way to address the outrageous exploitation of our work and of our labor. Thank you, Frank. I'll come back to you. Uh, and Monifa Bendeli, Akamwili Bendeli, who is a mom, and works with moms uh, in her organization and moms' movements. And that's so important, right? Because right now women are under attack, under attack, right? Yeah. The removal of our right to decide the actions of our body and the right to birth or not birth um, has been taken away. So what is the action that Moms on the Move is, is focused on? Yeah, so last year um, in June of 2022, um, the Dobbs decision in, in the Supreme Court essentially uh, reversed Roe v. Wade. So, you know, you have a whole generation of people who don't have a right, uh, depending on the state they live in, than their grandmothers did, right, who were giving birth in the 70s. So this is a huge rollback. Um, and then on the heels of that, um, additional lawsuits have come behind Dobbs. Um, there's attacks on, so now actual access to reproductive care and abortion access, but now also an attack on mefepristone, 
which is um, an abortion medication that's not only used for abortions, but also is used when someone's having a miscarriage. So there's this blocking of access to reproductive health care at every angle. And all of this is happening while um, maternal deaths are uh, rate is rising. You know, the United States in before Dobbs fell was the most dangerous place to give birth amongst all wealthy nations. It ranks dead last. And those maternal death rates are going up where even non-wealthy nations, the maternal mortality rate is going down. The United States is going up. And we actually saw a jump in um, maternal deaths in 2021, a jump of 40%, which is huge, right? And so you see all of the results of like the austerity, the attacks on democracy that EC talked about, everything that uh, Juan is talking about, the attack on like our political power um, results in, right? The lack of public health infrastructure and the lack of ability for communities to provide safe and healthy places for moms. And, you know, people who are uh, allowing for these attacks on abortions have to realize that, you know, six out of the 10 people seeking abortions are already moms, right? So much of this is about family planning. It's about economic security. It's, not, it's about making choices for your body, which, you know, we are behind 100%. But also, these are people who are making decisions about their families, right, and their family well-being. And it is interesting that people call themselves pro-life who also, though, then don't do anything about the maternal death rate, you know, don't do anything about the issues like uh, child care, access to health care, um, paid maternity leave, and all the things that you need <laughs> to have a, a safe and successful motherhood, um, but then want to force people into giving birth. So the hypocrisy is stark, but we understand because of all the conversation that's happened before that it's all connected, right, to this kind of like diluting and eroding and really a backlash on our growing political power. And how do you see uh, us, us responding to that? Yes. So one of the things is my theory is that this is, that we are in a backlash, right? That this backlash is because we are actually very powerful and that our union organizing, our grassroots organizing is a threat, right? To the infrastructures that want to make profit of, profits off of our bodies, off of our labor, right? So this is a constant backlash of the move forward. In 2020, we saw the largest mass protests in United States history around state violence, police killing uh, to end mass incarceration and mass criminalization. And yet, in 2022, this past year, was the deadliest year for police killing people. It was, it, we've now exceeded a thousand people per year, right? And where we've made gains on the ground, speaking of the law is not the law, where people like rolled up their sleeves. People weren't just marching in the streets. We worked on pieces of policies, and Juan knows this, to pass bills mm -hmm. in cities across the United States to 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 stop to build a dam to stop this police violence on our cities and so now what we see are which, which you call um you know either states are preempting cities so that they can't implement mm -hmm. the police reform forms that people passed the people voted for elected people into the city councils passed these things, and then the state is preempting that you see a rolling back, like in New York, we we pass a huge, beautiful uh, bail reform, right. Um, right in at the beginning of 2022, and now there's a there's an attack on the bail reform. And just now, just last month, the city of Washington D.C., um, through their elected city council people, voted in place a very comprehensive police reform bill, doing things like banning chokeholds, um, you know, police accountability. It wasn't even all that radical, but it was like a step forward. And you have the Congress of the United States intervening on the autonomy of a city, right, to halt a bill that they passed through people that the people of D.C. elected. So this attack on democracy is real, right? And so people are getting, being able to see how the, the goalpost continues to move, like, you vote, you're active, you put the people in place, you write the bills that you want, 
and still here's the backlash that comes in. And so I believe that's because of, you know, just our power um, and, and the, that potential of our power um, that we are seeing these things. But specifically on Roe, you know, at Moms Rising, we're hoping that people will sign on to our People's Amicus Brief. The fight around access to reproductive care is in the courts right now. It's not really mm -hmm. in Congress. And so we've organized with about two dozen other women's organizations across the country to put forth the members of our organization as a, a third party, you know, like not a part of the original party, but a third party to these to this court case to fight back. And so these these are some of the see, these are some of the organizing tactics that folks are doing. And I encourage people to sign on to this. I'll drop the link in the chat so it can be shared out mm -hmm. to add your voice as a party. Um, to the to pushback of this uh, attack on our abortion access. You know, you raise a point that I don't think our people either are aware of or believe that of the power we possess because of our numbers, right? And because of the way we understand the world and our experiences and the experiences of those who came before us. So how do we get that message out that the fear, the backlash has a lot to do, right? With our power, because somehow we think we're powerless, right? And what you're put, uh, putting forward is that we are powerful and we have to appreciate it, understand it and work with it. And I don't know that the meetings or the press, right? or anyone is articulating it the way that you just did. Yeah, clearly, you know, if unions weren't powerful, they wouldn't be attacking labor organizing, right? right. If voting right. wasn't powerful, we wouldn't see all of these voter suppression mm -hmm. laws being right. passed. Like, it's just clear as day. We're made to think, oh, all these things you're doing, it's not working, it's not worth anything. Well, if that was the case, then why are billions of dollars being spent, right, to undermine? Right these activities. So, you know, that's kind of like what we lead into. And I, I really, my hat goes off to Gen Z, to young people. Um, you know, you look at all around the country and whether it's around um, banning assault weapons or the um, fighting to end police and state violence, um, you know, there's really a groundswell, you know, of activism that's happening there. And they're being told, oh, it's nothing. It doesn't, it's not worth it. But look what happened in the Tennessee State House, right? If right. them protesting didn't mean anything, then why would you like expel two sitting members of the state legislature if all those young people showing up meant nothing, right? It is powerful. Um, so we have to look at the, the, to me, the backlash shows you how powerful it is. Uh, can, I can't agree with you more, Manifa. Uh, the backlash is clear yeah. and, it, and it works that way. You know, when you, when you have one of the two major political parties in this country, in the United States, literally claim that its political strategy is to stop eligible voters from voting. Because if too many eligible voters vote, the Republican Party will never win. I mean, that's exactly... The, the, it's like you, we use the very tools that we have to fight to incorporate our voices. And when we finally use those tools, we get to the level of uh, at the edge of the successes that Monifa is talking about and the backlash is real, but the backlash is only because we're at the point of finally realizing that collective power. Well, I think one of the things that concerns me, right, the backlash is the also. I'm sorry, you see, go That's ahead. Yeah, I think the backlash is really about information as well and about attacking the culture itself. You know, um, this attack, this make or woke or gism and, and all these comedians and people in the culture and, you know, talking about being conscious as a negative thing or, um, you know, the the boogeyman of critical race theory or or the, you know, the the idea that you can't discuss the truth of people's realities and that mm. it's illegal to talk about those things in a classroom are very specific 
cultural attacks and very specific attacks on consciousness in this country. And I think that it's, you know, in, in response to just how conscious some of, you know, some of Gen Z is and some of these, you know, these, these young people are that the attacks are on the culture itself as something negative to be alert, to be aware, to be uh, compassionate, to be inclusive, to be those things now are a pejorative in some of the narratives out there. Um, and I think that um, the censorship and the attack on information and the, I'm going to just say the bastardization of language and narratives to d disempower. I mean, I think that the right has done a really masterful job of co-opting language, of, of saying they're the party for freedom when they're the party that is against the vote, they're against, you know, autonomy of the body, they're against, um, you know, so many things that one call freedom, you know, the freedom of information, the freedom to think, and, and what you want to think. And they call themselves the party of life, which relegates others to what? The party of death, you know? <laughs> and, and just this way in which the language and the narratives, I mean, to, to Monifa's point, some of this backlash around criminal justice reform and the whipping up of this frenzied narrative about crime and criminals everywhere around you um, that has spawned some of the politicians in some of these so-called progressive cities to implement some reactionary and, and retroactive policies as well. And so I think we're at a critical moment in the culture where the attacks are not just legal, they're not just policy, but they're cultural attacks as well that are specifically meant to try to do what you were talking about, Marta, which is to disempower people or to not have people to fully understand the power in which they stand in this moment. Well, I think the the fear of censorship, right? It's like you're, we're back to the McCarthy era, right? Uh, where you can't say words. There are certain words you can't say. You can't say gay. You know, you're outlawed. Uh, if you teach a certain curriculum and Africana studies, or and that to me means African diaspora studies, Caribbean studies, that means the whole thing, right? So there's censorship in our voice, there's censorship in who we are, our identity, both racially and culturally. And if you remove that, you remove your identity. And that's the idea, right? To exterminate our being in a very real way. You know, you can do it through the mind, right? Empty the mind and then you empty the thought. So then how then do we center who we are, right? Which is culture, because all of us bring culture to the table. That's the point. So how do you attack culture when we are cultural beings? Not only us of color, but everyone is. I don't care what group nurtured you. You bring culture to the table and experiences to the table and historical experiences of your ancestors. So how do you destroy that and how do you advocate for that destruction. Hi, Esmeralda. Am I seeing you? We're not hearing you. Your, your voice. We can't hear you. You're muted. We're not hearing you. Can't hear you. So, you know, you that go, are going into the school, Juan, with your group, which is grounded in African traditions of Puerto Rico, right? Mm -hmm. The bomba, the plena. And this was music that survived, right? In That's spite right. of oppression. That's right. You know, Spanish oppression. Exactly. Right? And it was used as other cultures has used it as language, the drum, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as language. So, what happens to that if the kind of thinking that 
is being promulgated to erase culture does to not only, you know, you as a, the founder of the group, but it does in terms of culture being taught in the schools and being censored or well, attempted to be censored. No, of course. Uh, it, the same forces that want to stop the teaching of Africana studies are the same forces that are going to want to stop the sharing of the incredible richness of culture of drums in the African diaspora and throughout this entire hemisphere. Um, those two things are really, they're, they're tied. We see if, if the movement against being quote unquote woke is a movement that basically is against inclusion then everything that we've been doing to try to establish cultural markers, cultural uh, guideposts, so that our children recognize that they are living in an incredibly rich time in our history in which we can share these traditions that go back hundreds and hundreds of years, of course that's going to be attacked. Because at the end of the day, wokeness is seen as a threat to the homogeneity of a lot of people who feel that we can no longer accept diversity and inclusion. Well, the, I mean, the point is that uh, you can no longer, we've always had uh, the diversity of experiences, right? Yes. This land is built because Native people were first and developed it, right? We came, mm -hmm. we were brought, uh, we were brought in forcibly. Uh, so it always has included various cultures. You know, the attempt of white supremacy to develop a superiority process, right? right? And if you look at the pyramid, put themselves on top, right? Economically, racially, in terms of power, and the rest of us at the bottom of, of, of the pyramid. Uh, that has been constant. But now the attack is so overt and so shameless. And so avoiding all kinds of restrictions, then what is our response in this type of climate? Can we hear you, Esmeralda? And can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Oh, great. Well, our, uh, first of all, I'm very happy to be here and I'm very happy this discussion is taking place because if we remain silent, if we do not speak out, uh, they will think that what they're doing is effective. And you know what? It will be effective. So what can we do? Um, when they once again try to take away the drum, try to take away speaking, you know, speaking of, uh, of our ancestors that fought in this country uh, and through taking away Africana studies, taking away discussions uh, about books that help us to be awake. Uh, the Blue Asai is banned, uh, Tony Morrison, Song of Solomon is banned. Uh, we're all being banned. That's what they should put a sign on us. We're banned. So mm -hmm. what can we do? Well, the first thing that we should do is that we should continue to talk to ourselves. We need to keep talking to ourselves about what who we are, what we're about, so that people who cannot hear it from the institutions hear it from us. And that, that's everywhere. That's in us. In in the schools, in the schools, the spiritual worship places, uh, when we have uh, rituals and, and celebrations um, that 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 feature uh, Bombo and Plena, when we when we sit down at the dinner table with our family, when there are family occasions, you, we have to be the ones that start talking about this stuff. Not only what our history was, but what they're trying to do again. And I have to say again. And I missed the first half, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating things. And then what else can we do? Well, I just found out yesterday, I'm, I was behind the times, that we're boycotting Florida. There is a boycott Florida movement afoot. So no, I will not be going on that cruise with my family as going out of, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, where was it, Cape Canaveral. Um, I'm not doing anything, nothing. Boycotting the products, boycotting the state, boycotting anything that reeks 
of Florida and saying why we're doing it. So I'm passing that boycott uh, 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 text or email that I got along to everybody. And I said, don't, when I say no, this is why. Uh, the mm -hmm. other thing that we obviously have to do, and it's already being done, uh, but understand that this is a, a cat and mouse game too. Uh, I'll explain the cat and mouse part. Um, is obviously we're going to go into their courts to challenge their actions when more and more of the judges are saying, oh, that's okay. Um, we're going uh -huh. to do that. But listen to the cat and mouse part about this. We have to do it because we cannot remain silent publicly either. But they want us to go chasing the mouse. Every time they do something against us, they want us to take up all our time and energy chasing them and saying that you can't do that and, and hoping the courts back us up. Well, the bad news is the courts are not backing us up anymore for all when they should be. Now, the courts, the law is not the law. We're back to, we're back to Judge Taney uh, and Plessy versus Ferguson, who, you know, uh, 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 a black man has no rights. Let's put people in there. Let's put people of color in there. Let's put people of African descent in there. Have no rights that a white man need respect. We're back to that. And we'll see how far they go with that. Um, if you give me a chance, I want to rattle on about the other things that they're doing that our people are, do not seem to be aware of affects us because it doesn't have race and culture splatted across it. We think it doesn't affect us. And I'm talking about their attack on things that are called substantive due process rights, uh, which which extends to our people because we're the people uh, who disproportionately uh, 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 use those rights. And I'm talking about disability rights. I'm talking about uh, uh, LGBT rights. I'm talking about rights uh, uh, afforded to the aged. I'm talking about privacy rights, rights of grandparents. We're the ones mm -hmm. that go after those rights disproportionate to our population that need those rights because of what we've experienced in this society. And they're going after all of them. They've already put a warning sign when they knock down abortion. They put a big flag. We are also going after these other things. We don't think they should exist either. So folks, understand they're coming at us at all angles. The direct one, of course, that's dearest to my heart, uh, is when they hit us, uh, hit our culture, and say that we cannot teach, that our culture should not be te taught, that that our political and history perspective should not be allowed, because it's divisive. It's divisive. So I'm going to stop talking. <coughs> but understand that the main weapon we have is to teach ourselves. I'm saying teach. We have to go back to political education, teaching ourselves. Every one of my grandchildren already knows how I feel about Florida. And they said, that's my grandmother. That's what she does. I said, no, that's, this is about you. You're the one growing up into this. You have to know what's going on. So I'll stop there. But well, I think uh, the question of censorship, the it? question of censorship, right, comes to the center, right, in my mind and the discussion we're having. Because the information, right, the public information that's out there is not saying what, what, what I'm hearing from this, uh, you as a panel, right? Uh, there is a level of complicity with the press and with public news that, um, you know, we all tune into the news in the morning to get the news, but the news is not the news. That could be another panel. The news is not the news. <laughs> because we're not getting information or the information that you're sharing with us now. So there is a level of censorship that we need to call out that I think our people are not understanding. That no. we're being silenced, right? In ways that is not giving us the information that we need. And where is that information if it's not coming through what we think is the public media right then how do we address that well in in the old in the old days we had a we had our own uh we had our own grapevine and we also had our own newspapers 
Uh, we also had our own radio shows. Uh, we also had, we even had TV shows on their networks. But if you look at what's out there now, you'll see that even, even um, CNN is cutting back on who on who we can listen to that we can trust. Um, uh, so I'm saying that uh, it's going to go back to self-reliance. Uh, this this broadcast, your 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 center, uh, the lectures uh, given by I'm going to tease you one by Professor Wan uh, in the classroom and 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 in the community. Um, the the fabulous work that's done by ISIS and the fact that Monifa is known to tell the truth about what is happening, particularly with our youth, far and wide. We have to be the messenger. And I'm sorry, but you are chief messenger, Dr. Vega. Uh, we have to keep saying it. I thank you for having this panel, but this panel needs to be every week. We, we said this the last time. We need to have our own broadcast about what the news are, what's happening in the news, some way of streaming it ourselves. Uh, and with the technology is there, but but we're not doing that now because all of us are trying to make a living. But we're gonna have to put time aside and keep ourselves informed by our own means. It's come back down to that by our own means. We have we we have been uh, quietly exiled from the news of this country, except when they're beating up on us, then they'll they'll broadcast that that they've taken us taken away another right. They'll they'll blast that over the screen, or they'll blast all over the screen. You know, uh, a line of young black men in handcuffs. But anything that has to do that's really relevant to us, where we need to get organized. And get and get mobilized around, they're not putting a word out on that, except to say it's criminal activity. Remember the Black Lives Matter movement. Remember how they portrayed that. Rioters and looters. Mm -hmm. So what do we do about teachers that are being penalized for teaching? Right, well, our histories and our experiences when they're supposed, when we fought so hard to have curriculums that reflect, right, not only us but the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, that was a major battle, right? It, for us in the seventies and eighties, that was a major battle. The curriculum, the the material, the content of education, because mm -hmm. education is not enough. We know it's the content, right? And we were successful in putting in the histories of the nation. And that has been now, it has been censored in various ways. So do we go back to uh, forming our schools? What What's the next step? We, all of the above, but I wanna say something about all the hard work we did in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. Um, um, use New York as an example. Uh, I worked hard on the curriculum of, of inclusion for New York State. Uh, I know I know several people on the panel worked very hard, and I'm talking about yeah. over a year laboring for that with scholars. But I was I was the advocate amongst them, as was so of you, some of you, and with all that hard work, I'm going to tell the truth. That curriculum languished in New York State. For the most part, it was never used to the point where I actually heard a state legislature legislator say, we need to have a curriculum. And I had to inform him and then another person, her, that we did this 30 years ago. It's done. It's actually in the regulations. Nobody is enforcing that. It definitely doesn't take precedent over over teaching to the test. That's for sure. And even when they teach to the test, the test is often riddled with inaccuracies and lies about our people that our students are supposed to 
check off the wrong answer to get it right. So I'm saying that the battle that we thought we won by doing all that hard work in the 80s was not really won because it was never implemented across the board. And, and I think that that's, that that's a, a, a point that curriculum, all of this is politics. All of it is politics. When we saw those so-called activists go into school board meetings and decry critical race theory and all that, you know, the the theatrics of that that were portrayed, those were political acts on the other side. Then those same players made it their their business to elect their people onto school boards, onto all the way to the governor, because we saw that it's the governor, who, DeSantis, who's who from a top down situation is banning and censoring and outlawing X, Y and Z. So just all of this to me is is political. And what really worries me is that the 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 mechanisms of politics of how it's done in this country are being so corrupted by now legal partisan gerrymandering, by the taking away of federal rights and putting it to the states and creating a Swiss cheese of rights depending on where you live and where you don't live. Um, and it's just a, a complete dismantling of what the process is for checks and balances for being heard and they're doing it from the top down from the bottom up and being really strategic in their plan on how to stifle the vote because to, at the end of the day people mm -hmm. in authority who make these decisions on our behalf and those are those are the levers of power that need to be pressed upon on our behalf and I think that um, that that's the most concerning part is that the processes that have been in place, as imperfect as they were, are even are, are just being dismantled in a way that I think is is very detrimental to our ability to correct some of these things on a structural and systematic basis moving forward. Uh, Marta, I I don't want that that that. Thank you so much, AC. I don't want this moment to pass without pointing out that uh, that Juan was in Florida doing redistricting work this year. And it's a mess. It is. So I'm not going to speak. He was there. No, I was flooding him. New it York is. was a mess. <laughs> well, New I was, was doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wanted to speak on Florida because Florida was a mess. And it still is. I mean, the... the, <clears throat> the um, we should, at one point, we should continue to have this conversation because at the end of the day, recognizing the role of how these political parties take control of both houses and the governor's office in a state um, with the kind of demographics of a place like Florida requires us to really dig deeper about how people of color are also complicit in this takeover by the Republican Party in Florida. Mm. Well, that's important. And, and I, I think that we need to have not necessarily on Facebook, right? Uh, but we need to have conversations on how our people have been complicit as well. Because it seems to me that I'm not a party politics person and never been active other than really voting. And I'm saying we realize that those of us who have been uh organizes right most of our lives at different stages of our lives right for different issues saw it saw the dismantling of government saw the dismantling of institutions right uh, putting people door catches right uh to deal with the environmental issues and so on and so forth purposely putting people who were not experts in those areas to destroy those institutions so that the complicity had to be across the board in many ways. It couldn't be just the uh, right-leaning parties, right? It had to be broader than that. And what 
the purpose of doing it broader than that, right? The issue of power that you brought one and the issue of wealth, right? So yeah. I wish you would talk more on what happened in Florida because last year, like I was going to get an award by the Hispanic in philanthropy and I refused to go to Florida. I absolutely refuse because I said, why give Florida any, uh, a, a, any of our money, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> by going to Florida with all that's being passed to suppress our thinking, our vote, and our being. I mean, and those decisions we to be, have to make as to, to where we go. To be fair, for the same reasons that you would boycott Florida, you would boycott 28 other states in this union you know that's well, not florida is, is not really an outlier <laughs> hmm? <laughs> florida is the poster child right now and the mm -hmm. is happy to stand up i love that name DeSantis. um yeah right uh uh but he he is happy to be the poster child he is happy to stand up there and say it and we should be very happy to point at florida not that it's not that the other ones are innocent, but point at Florida and say, This is what's happening in Florida. We will not participate. Um, it's uh, uh I'm gonna say the depth, the depth of the deprivation of rights, um, uh, is something that can't even be covered in one show. We could do a show on each one of the rights that are going down the drain and understand something. We, I know this has probably been said already, we are in the post the post civil civil rights movement uh, uh, regression in terms of our liberation and freedom. This is the backlash, folks. Some people say it's the Obama backlash. Oh no, this was brewing way before Obama was coming in. They were trying to pull back all the way going back to Reagan. And now it's a full flown, a full, full blown attack. Uh, open, open attack against everything that people said they wanted in this country not more than 20 years ago, not more than 10 years ago. And now, uh, the, the oh, I said, I said, the, the true, the true, the, the mask is pulled off and America is standing there naked uh, with a big, gigantic flag draped across representing uh, uh, um, the belief in white supremacy uh, and white privilege. The rest of us can go to hell as far as they're concerned. Monifa, would you like to join in? Hello? Yeah, that um, you know, we were that's what we were saying before, um, that this is this is a backlash and that the the anecdote is like we were saying, organizing. The attack on organized labor is because organized labor works. The attacks on our grassroots organizations is because organizing work. The attacks on education is because you have an entire generation of people who went to these universities and were exposed to the African studies departments that were fought for and won in the 60s and 70s and so by seeing the outcome of that, they're like, no, we, we, we gotta stop that. Um, the folks going into the school boards to ban books. It's because nobody wants Gen Z to read a book. Gen Z is turning up, they the turn up crew. So definitely don't want them to read a book, right? <laughs> so all of that, you know, uh, before you got on Esmeralda, I used the same term is that it's, it's, the, it's a backlash because of how powerful we are when we organize and we move forward as a movement. And so we are being kind of like attacked on all fronts, but I, we, we, we're still, you know, we're still in it. We're, we're here talking, you know, you said that Juan was fighting the, um, the lines being drawn in Florida just last year. Um, I'm on the board of uh, Black Voters Matter. I mean, the level of work that people are doing on the ground, going door to door to, to, you know, to stop fascism in its tracks in 2020 and 2022. It's, it's, it's a huge, you know, it's a huge lift, but we are working in the tradition of 
what has already been done. You know, like you said, it's going way back. Um, but the messaging um, before you got on that um, EC said was important is that it's not being framed that way, right? If you turn on the news, it's almost like, Woke is a bad word, being conscious, being politically active, you know, pushing and pushing the conversation forward, you know, raising your hand in school and saying that's offensive to me. All of that now is like it's it's bad. You know, comedians are attacking. Uh, just the just the concept of being conscious and aware, you know, so, yeah, this is repeating what was said before, but it is because of the power uh, that we have when we organize. And, and Monifa, how many people came out during Black Lives Matter protests? Yeah, so in 2020, there was 25 million people, and that's by their count, which we know is an undercount. You had protests for the first time in every single state on Juneteenth, all demanding an end to state violence, police killing. And then what do we see in 2022, um, which, which I laid out, right? D.C. voters work because people weren't just protesting in the streets. We had policies that we put forward and won. And so now it is the taking away of that. We're going to attack the bail reform. That's We're going right. to stop D.C. from passing their police reform bills. Uh, Congress will intervene in a city legislation. I've never seen that before. I don't know if the lawyers oh, can say that it's ever happened before. Over overseer for D.C. D.C. is like their child, you know? Jackson, Mississippi, right? They want to run their city, but the state of Mississippi, because Jackson's a black city run by a progressive black mayor, and they've mm -hmm. elected their city council, and they're also putting in putting stops to state violence on the city uh, citizens. And they're like, we'll take your power away. St. Louis, you know? So this is because we've, we've organized. It wasn't just protests in the street. That's there was right. the squad, right, that was, that was for... Mm -hmm. And then in 2020 it was six, and now it's ten of them. With now, um, Summer Lee and Jasmine Crockett, you know, like the ranks of Congress of like young, um, progressive people who are all about invest, divest, all about all the things that we're talking about is growing because of our organizing. That's right. And and Monta, you said before, what can we do? The best thing we could do is to talk to our people, teach our people, and the most powerful thing we can do is to organize across the board. I, I applaud your work, Monif um, Monifa, I applaud it. And, and it heartens me because I see you as a younger person. I know you're not youth anymore, <laughs> but you're young to me, um, carrying on. Tell us. <laughs> no, ca carrying on the struggle. This, I mean, carrying on the struggle. And for a while I was getting, I was despairing. And then, and then young folks stood up. So no, they, they're going to try to take everything away, but they cannot take away our voice. They cannot take away our, our desire and, and our ability to work for, toward our freedom. And they cannot take away our solidarity with each other something that they're trying very hard to do, to put a wedge between us, between people of color, to put a, put a wedge between us and unions, organized unions, us and labor, uh, to put a wedge between uh, um, people who are low income of any race, to put a wedge there to make sure that they remain in power. Um, I still stand by my uh, not it's not my prophetic genius. Um, fear of a black planet is real, folks. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think that I one of the things that uh, AC's brought up is something that we should pay attention to, and we did early in the seventies and eighties. Is the narrative that's being put out there is using a lot of the terminology that has been normal to us. But in putting out the terminology from the right point of view, right, um, it is subverting the yeah. meaning of what we narrated, right? And the original constructed as the narration. 
So that ISIS was addressing that. And I think that that's something that we have to pay attention to, what the narrative for this moment is and the definition of terminology that we use is because people use community in ways that um, we did not, mm -hmm. right? We meant solidarity. Uh, woke, right, that DeSantis keeps using like if he was some uh, uh, robot, right? <laughs> it, it's not what we, the terminology, the definition that we gave to woke. So that and there's a narrative vernacular. that has to be clarified. Woke is also black vernacular. Mm -hmm. Right. Like woke, the term woke comes out of my generation. That comes out of hip hop. You know, exactly. stay woke. That's what that's they right. say back in the nineties. You know, Erica Badu songs, Nas' songs. You know, that's this was, right. This was a call to like not be a slave, not to be asleep. Right. So it's very interesting that they, you know, like you were saying earlier, it's attack on these words, but these words are really us. The real attack is on us. Right, mm -hmm. you anti woke exactly. is like you anti black. It's the, that's, we, right. that's our term. We're we woke. We brought that to the fore. But I wanted to say, um, in terms of more celebrating of Gen Z, like I overheard recent grads of um, they're coming out of an Ivy League school, and they're talking about what they're going to do next. This is graduation season, and then one was like, "I'm going to go to Starbucks to start a union." One was like, "I'm going to get a job at the Amazon factory to start a union." Like they they were having the strategic mind to go in and be organizers coming out of these institutions. Whereas like when we were in school, it was about, oh, well, I want to, you know, who's going to go to this profession, this graduate school. And so I just, I mean, it just made me smile so hard that there's this understanding that we got to build power, right? Having people in these like high level professions, that's good, right? But it's, the workers, you know, that Juan was talking about earlier, is that organized labor that really shifts the needle. Um, even when we were doing the protests in 2020, I swear the most powerful moment for me right down here in Brooklyn was that, I don't know if people remember, the mayor issued a curfew. We've never had a curfew right. in um, New York, as far as I've known, right? And the, the, they would actually corral the rally so that you couldn't leave it until it was the curfew, right? And then when the curfew hits, then the police would swarm in and like arrest the protesters. This was the method day in and day out to attack mm -hmm. protesters and to take everyone to jail. And so one day, right, as it, and it, it was so many that they had to use MTA buses to carry protesters to, to jail. Because this, this is like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. So one day they're going to put all the protesters on the bus and you see all the bus drivers step off the buses. They refuse to drive the bus, okay? Mm -hmm. There was no real coordination in this it, moment. It didn't say a word, they just stepped off. Central organizers to TWU, right. but then TWU tweets out, we are the transit workers union. It is our job to take working New Yorkers to and from their livelihoods. We are not the NYPD. I mean, it was just like one clear sentence because as organized labor, they understood. And when they stood up as organized labor, they were the most powerful force, right? Everybody that day got to go home because there's not enough squad cars to take, you know, 2,000 people down to Central Book and you need the buses. And then it happened in Minneapolis and then it happened in Oakland because the union spoke across the country that the bus drivers were not going to allow them to use that. You know, you can get on the bus because the bus belongs to the city. Right. But it's not my job to violate people's uh, Fourth Amendment. Right. And so it's yes, when it, power like that, you know, and it's not talked about or it wasn't highlighted in the news. That's the backlash when like, oh, what? So how do we highlight it? Because those stories are inspiring. That is that they gave me thrills. It gave me yes. thrills. I love it. Those are inspiring stories. Tommy John, it's not Tommy John up on a pedestal. It's a bus driver getting off a bus and every single one. I mean, how good can it get? That was it. It was a simple act. They just got off the bus. Right. What what the bus? Right. Right. Arrest me. So, they didn't try to arrest the bus drivers. 
So you've got, you know, these younger intelligent people say, we, I'm going to go into transit. I, we, we need organized labor, right? We, you know, understanding that we have to build power is what came out of decades of us having these African studies, you know, organizing institutes in these schools. They're under attack now, but enough of us have benefited from that education, you know, that we have sparks of that continuing. And like I said, Gen Z is the And that's what our institutions need to keep doing. That's the role of building institutions, right? That's right. And we have to go back to some of these African studies department and, and, and use a little stun gun to remind them how they came into being and the fact that they should be addressing the politics of this time, not looking, not just looking for tenure. Exactly. Exactly. So I'd like to sort of ram Robin and have some final words from you in terms of what do you see the next steps being on the issues that you have addressed? So can we start with you, Isis? Because time is uh, oh, coming to a close soon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we talked a little bit and I think it's it boils down to um, personal consciousness projected in collective power, you know, and, and it starts really for me um, as as a as a woman, as a as a black woman, as a priest, you know, I I center myself in that power of of who I am, um, and that's why for me the the bit about which is so important. I mean, it's all about claiming all this. OER so that you can come together with other people and project that power collectively in the places in which the levers of power matter, right? So it's to be strategic about where it is we project power in places in which it will have the most effect. And so I think that, um, you know, it starts with the the part about consciousness about education about claiming culture self organizing and projecting that power strategically one final yes thought. yes yes what i put on the table earlier today was the outrageous economic condition that we find ourselves in the country and globally as well with the outrageous exploitation of the ultra rich to the needs of the people who are working class in this country. And I think the way to address that in a much more effective way is for many of us to start learning more, getting data, getting a handle on how investments occur in this country and how many times with good organizing and just accessing the data about Wall Street and how it greases the wheels of these ultra rich billionaires, we can shame them sometimes into doing things that they don't want to do. So again, it's data, it's education, it's organizing, but recognizing that the money and the outrageous forms of exploitation and profit um, and the gap between the ultra wealthy and the working class can be addressed in various ways if we just get the data, organize around it, and shame these corporations and these corporate elites. Thank you. Esmeralda? I know that you came in late, so <laughs> well, um, give us some thought, some final thoughts. <laughs> exactly. My final thoughts are um, For now. Uh, a bit of a repeat. Um, the most powerful tool we have is to organize. Uh, and the second most powerful tool we have is to teach and continue to let our people know, everyone in your circle, everyone at your job, everyone in your religious community, let them know what you know. Even if you think that's going to sound a little out there, they have to hear it and they have to hear it from us. Those who know, teach. We know. We got to keep saying it. And I'm just going to keep urging Marta to organize a zillion of these because of uh, we it doesn't spend, fall can, on not this show is only it falls on all of our shows. I get that. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah because we could, nah, we could nah, talk, nah. just talking about voting and and how electoral power works in this country. 
I think would be a, a, a eye opener for some folks, particularly when folks get elected to office. What 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 power do they have? Well, we have to remember the organizations like the East, right? Uh, when we started in Museo and various organizations, right? We started those organizations mm -hmm. to make sure that our people had safe spaces, number one, understood and appreciated our history legacy. Uh, also to um, displace, right? The Eurocentric white supremacist vision mm -hmm. and expose and, um, and have our communities understand our vision and our history. Right. And we did that. And we have done that for more than 50 years. And, and the churches have done that. Right. Um, I guess the question becomes, how does it continue going right. forward? How does this information continue to be structured going forward? What does the new technology or does it assist us in doing that? And then ultimately, who does it? Right because it's not one person. How do we inspire others to do it? I mean, that what you brought forward, Monifa, was amazing to me. That story of the bus driver, right? right? Uh, it, 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 I mean, that's inspiring. That happened to mm -hmm. us when we were in the Orisha conference in Georgia. And I don't know if you were on the bus, Esmeralda with us, but when we were being taken to the airport, a car tried to push the, the bus off the road. No, and I... all of us on the road, right? African descendants, all of us on the road. He, uh, the driver, also African descendant. And then his boss called him. And, and his boss tells him, oh, uh, you were going to push the, the, some car with white people on the bus. Uh, off the road, and it was absolutely the other way around. The story was the other way around. Luckily, we all came to the front of the bus and we said, no, we were being pushed off the road, right? Because he was going to be penalized for supposedly moving the car that was accusing him of, of pushing us off the road, right? So that these things continue to happen. They happen today. Right? They're not stories that are of the past. They're stories of the present. And how do we bring them forward? This young man on the train it was strangled in front of people. Oh my God. People yeah. videoing him. Where's that humanity? Right? What is our role in this moment? And I think the telling us of our experiences is key. Because people, in my opinion, and this is totally my opinion, are at a comfort level. Thank you. That thought is not even an idea. The Housewives of Atlanta is not going to free you. <laughs> well, I've never seen it, so but I can only think by the, by the title. So that the question becomes to me, how do people think or not think? Right, we started this whole gallery around it titled Ori, mm -hmm. and the idea is think, right? Think what would happen to you, to your children, to your grandchildren if we don't act at this moment, if we don't talk at this moment, if we don't teach at this moment, right? And as you said, we have to teach at the dinner table, we have to teach wherever we are, right. We have to inform because if people are trying to stop us from thinking, and that's what's happening, right? And and Easy said it a lot better than than I, right? If they're trying to penalize the word woke, that is a term that, that uh, uh, comes out of us, right? And is being used to attack us. Where are we? So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have some questions and I don't have my glasses. Uh, uh, no. Are we going to hear words from Monifa? Yeah. Monifa, uh, give us some thoughts 
as we oh, end yeah. this conversation. Yeah, I dropped the um, article Thank about you. the bus drivers from all over the country. And it made me think about, um, you know, just being raised in an African independent school, which you talked about. We were taught that when ants unite, they can lift an elephant, mm -hmm. right? These are the lessons that we teach when we build our own schools to our to our children, you know, as opposed to, you know, you're a worker bee, you're a worker ant. You know, we were taught that this is power, this is power in us coming together. And so understanding that, you know, seeing that um, action uh, by the Transit Workers Union just really has solidified in me that we are going to win. Like we, like we are in a backlash, but that we will be victorious because we have that understanding and we are, we are the mini ants, right? At the end of the day, we, we hold that wild card so I'm just really happy to have this conversation. And thank you all for having yeah. the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you for sharing your thoughts. And we will continue to be the little ants that'll lift the elephant, right? So thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.